Turn with me, a copy of God's Word, to Leviticus chapter 3. Leviticus chapter 3. <clears throat> Leviticus chapter 3. Give heed to the Word of God. And if his oblation be a sacrifice of peace offering, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons, the priest, shall sprinkle the blood upon the altar round about. And he shall offer the sacrifice of the peace offering, an offering made by fire unto the Lord the fat that covereth the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by <clears throat> the flanks and the caul above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And Aaron's sons shall burn it on the altar, upon the burnt sacrifice, which is upon the wood that is on the fire. It is an offering made by fire of a sweet savor unto the Lord, and if his offering for a sacrifice, a peace offering unto the Lord be of the flock, male or female, he shall offer it without blemish. If he offer a lamb for his offering, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And Aaron's sons shall sprinkle the blood thereof round about upon the altar. And he shall offer of the sacrifice of the peace offering an offering made by fire unto the Lord. The fat thereof and the whole rump, it shall he take off hard by the backbone. And the fat that covereth the inwards and all the fat that is upon the inwards and the two kidneys and the fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn it upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by fire unto the Lord. And if his offering be a goat, then he shall offer it before the Lord. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of it and kill it before the tabernacle of the congregation. And the sons of Aaron shall sprinkle the blood thereof upon the altar round about. And he shall offer thereof his offering even an offering made by fire unto the Lord, that the fat covering the inwards, and all the fat that is upon the inwards, <clears throat> and the two kidneys, and the flat fat that is upon them, which is by the flanks, and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it shall he take away. And the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food, the offering made by fire for a sweet savor, all the fat is the Lord's. It shall be a perpetual statute for all generations throughout all your dwellings that ye eat neither fat nor blood. Amen. As far reading God's holy word. Well, today we'll be considering the next law of the various sacrifices which Jehovah God himself instituted in the book of Leviticus. As I mentioned before, as we end a chapter in, in Luke, we'll be considering Leviticus and these laws. Well, last time we considered the meat or grain offering. And before that, we had looked at the burnt offering. And we have seen that the burnt offering was to be performed every single day, morning and evening. One of the main purposes of the burnt offering was to cleanse you of your sins in order that you may approach and be in the presence of God in his house in order that God would be able to receive you and find you acceptable. For without the burnt offering, without that offering of atonement, there is no way a person can approach God and live. It's a reminder that we need atonement for our sins 
through a blood sacrifice. It was also to remind the person offering the sacrifice that the atonement of another was required to be able to approach the presence of God. That one's person was not sufficient. That in, to, in order to be acceptable in the sight of God, we could not bring our good works and be found acceptable. We need a blood sacrifice of another to be able to approach the presence of God. And God has taught us since Genesis <clears throat> that the only way anyone can be accepted by God is through a blood sacrifice. That's it. The only way God will find you acceptable, even today, is through a blood sacrifice. For without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission or no removal of your sins. If you want to be found acceptable to God, you must approach him through a blood sacrifice. That's it. And you see, anything you do that you think is good on your own behalf, and you try out of your own goodness, so-called goodness, to then approach God based on that, it is just as futile and useless as the fig leaves than Adam and Eve sowed together to cover their own sins. Remember what happened there. God had to provide a blood sacrifice to cover their sins and to dress them with animal skins because their fig leaves were not sufficient. When you try to approach God based on your works, might as well approach him with fig leaves covering your sins. Futile. Futile. <clears throat> the sacrifice of the burnt offering then pointed towards the perfect sacrifice, the perfect shedding of blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. The next sacrifice which we considered last time was the grain offering or the meat offering in Leviticus 2. This sacrifice can only be offered after the burnt offering. And it was a bloodless sacrifice. There is no blood. It was a grain offering where we acknowledge to God that because he has redeemed us, all that is ours, everything that is us, we ourselves, our spouse, our children, belong to him. And that we are willing to give all to him, including ourselves. You see, the grain offering or the meat offering was a sacrifice where we are showing our complete devotion, dedication, loyalty, and resolve to follow him all the days of our lives by giving all of ourselves to him in service. It is an acknowledgement that we belong to him because through his atonement, he has purchased us. So we belong to him. You see, you are not free. You are not your own master. You either are the master to sin or you're the master to Christ. You are servant to Christ. So either sin is your master or Christ is your master. Either you serve your own desires and lusts or you serve Christ. And if you are in Christ, then serve Christ. And the grain offering, the meat offering, was a symbol, an image of such devotion and surrender to God. And these concepts are found everywhere in the New Testament. Everywhere in the New Testament. You want to understand these things in the New Testament about belonging to him, being a living sacrifice? Do you need to look at Leviticus to understand these things in its fullness? Yes, <clears throat> the specific sacrifice of animals and of grain are done away. We don't do that today. We're never to do that ever again. 
because Christ has done it all for us. But the principles that undergird these ceremonies are still with us today, are still reinforced today in Christ. For example, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, we read there, For you are bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. You see, both your body and your spirit belongs to God because he purchased it. He bought your body and your blood with a price. And what price was that? What price was that? The blood of Jesus Christ. He purchased you. This is why you are to take care of both your body and your soul. Not just your soul. But your body, you should take care of your body. You should nurture it, nur uh, um, nurture it correctly in a healthy manner. Stay away from junk food, right? Exercise your body. Protect your body because it belongs to Christ. He purchased it. it. Belongs to Him. Part of keeping the sixth commandment. <clears throat> Revelation chapter five verse nine reads the following. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every, every kindred and tongue and people and nation. You see, Jesus has redeemed us. He has bought us by his blood, with his blood. This is what the burnt offering signified. And because he bought us, we belong to him. And therefore, we are to dedicate body and soul to God in all that we do. Because we belong to Jesus, we have something else that no other religion offers, and that is an intimate fellowship with God. And this is what the peace offering is all about. And it is very beautiful once you see past all the descriptions of kidneys and livers and gallbladders. It's all there. This intimacy that we have with God that is the purpose and the analogy that is given in this peace offering. In every true sense of the word, when you believe on Jesus, you become a friend of God. This is what the peace offering <clears throat> refers to, among other realities, which we will now explore. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. If this oblation be a sacrifice, a peace offering, <clears throat> excuse me, if he offer it of the herd, whether it be a male or a female, he shall offer it without blemish before the Lord. If you remember the burnt offering, you remember it's only a male. But here, God is saying it could be a male or a female. And this is significant. This is important. <clears throat> you see, in a burnt offering, it must only be a male. It can never be a female in a burnt offering. Because remember, the burnt offering cleanses sin. It is pointing to Jesus Christ, specifically. A woman was not going to redeem mankind, but a man. Redemption was going to come through a man, and that man is Jesus Christ. A female animal could never be offered for atonement because that would destroy the significance of the gospel given to Adam. Because in Adam we all sinned. Therefore, only another Adam to redeem. Not another Eve, but another Adam. And so the nonsense going around among <clears throat> pagan revivals of feminism, which some, even some Christian churches have adopted, they end up allowing for this blasphemous idea of a female redeemer. And that should be despised by all true Christians. However, here in the peace offering, God is stating 
that both male and female, both men and women, can have fellowship with God. Not just the men, but the women. Because in Christ, there is no longer male or female in that sense, in that we are equal in the sight of God because of Christ. And therefore, the peace offering also goes against another foolish extreme that's found in churches, that a woman can have no participation with God when the scriptures allow it. Think of Hannah, the mother of Samuel. She herself, not her husband, she herself offered the burnt offering and the meat offerings in the temple. Because women can do it. We see that in 1 Samuel chapter 1. The women themselves, not the men, the women themselves, when they were bringing the burnt offering or, or the peace offering, were to slaughter the animals themselves. Don't let that significance pass over you. It was not their hands, their husbands, their fathers, but the women themselves. Women were also allowed into the tabernacle to pray. We see Hannah doing the same thing, 1 Samuel 1. See, women have a right and a privilege to fellowship with God through Christ directly. You see, Christ is their mediator as well. Just notice how often Christ spoke to women, sat with them, drank with them, ate with them, and how shocked the hyper-patriarchal type men or that the toxic masculine men lashed out on Christ because he did that. And when we get to Luke 17, we're going to see how even children have a right to Jesus Christ. So let's not overreact one way or the other. It does not come with the, the, the blasphemy of the left-wing feminism, nor the pharisaical hyper-toxicity of patriarchy that some men advocate in the church. Both are rejected by Christ. <clears throat> Our Lord instructs us in this peace offering that we all have a right and fellowship with God if we have true faith in the atoning blood of Jesus Christ and have committed ourselves to him. What exactly is a peace offering? What is the Hebrew word for peace? Probably right now you're thinking of the word shalom, and you'll be very close. The Hebrew word here for peace offering is a different word. It is shalem, shalem, very similar to shalom. Shalem means fellowship through sacrifice or fellowship or alliance or friendship through sacrifice. That's what a peace offering means. A fellowship, a friendship that is obtained through sacrifice. It is the most intimate forms of fellowship because you have two parties which were enmity or enemies towards each other that made peace and our friends, that such a result was achieved <clears throat> by a blood sacrifice and therefore by a covenant ratified with blood is what this signifies. And we see this concept throughout the Old Testament in anticipation of Jesus Christ and the coming Lord's Supper and the Lord's Table where intimacy is achieved by sitting around a table to feast with Christ, which itself is a sign of the reality which is to come, namely the marriage supper of the Lamb. We see this when God was establishing the proper form of worship and giving the law to Israel. We read of a covenant meal and fellowship with God in Exodus chapter 24, verses 10 through 12, where we read this. And they saw the God of Israel, 
And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of a sapphire stone. And as it were, the body of heaven in his clearness. That should provoke revelation to you where it describes what heaven is like. And upon the nobles of the children of Israel, he laid not his hand. Also they saw God and did eat and drink. Covenant meal, fellowship, intimacy with God. And the Lord said unto Moses, Come up to me into the mount and be there, and I will give thee tables of stone and a law and commandments which I have written, that thou mayest teach them. You see, there's this intimacy connected with a meal. The peace offering then expresses our relationship with Jehovah after we have been redeemed, atoned for, and saved. After we have devoted ourselves, our goods, and talents to him, we can then enjoy such fellowship and friendship with the one true and living God, which the peace offering signifies. And it was a joyful sacrifice, <clears throat> as you can imagine. The underlying principle is this. Only a person with true faith in Jesus Christ can enjoy this fellowship today. This kind of fellowship can only be enjoyed if you believe in Christ. In the law before us, <clears throat> Jehovah maintains the same strictness as before. Whether an ox or a cow, lamb or a goat, the animal is without blemish. This is to entail a perfect fellowship that we have with God through Jesus Christ. It is only because of Jesus Christ that we can enjoy this privilege. For he and he alone brings peace between God and man. How many men and women on earth tell themselves and tell others that they are a good enough person that God will accept them on their own merits? How many men and women <clears throat> tell others that God will accept them because, you know, they're not really evil people? They're not like Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot. And they say, I can come close to God because I'm good enough. Christian, when you hear people say things like that, they're lying to themselves. They're deceiving themselves. Because if you believe that you are a good person, good enough to come to God, then you have declared war against God. You are at war with God. And you have stated to God that you're such a good person that you do not need a blood sacrifice to come in front of him. That your own works of your hands are enough, are sufficient. Because you believe that God will accept you on your own merits. In other words, you're saying you are without blemish. Like these animals. You're saying you don't need Jesus. Anytime a man or a woman says, I'm a good enough person that God will accept me, you are declaring that you don't need Jesus. You're rejecting the only begotten Son of God. And that is scary. And so if this is how you think right now, that you can approach God, that because you think you're a good person, that you do good works, and because of that you can approach God, that I call you to repent of that sin. Repent of your rebellion and your war against God. Because it is blasphemy. And God will not accept you because of you. So repent, turn from that sin, and believe on Jesus Christ alone. Because he is the only blood sacrifice that God will accept for you to be able to stand in front of him. And if you don't believe in Jesus, 
There is no way God will receive you in his presence. There is no way that you will have fellowship with God. No matter what you hear in the world, no matter what you hear on TV, I don't care what Oprah or Dr. Phil tells you, if you are not in Christ, you are condemned. So turn from your sin and turn to Christ. Because just one blemish, one sin is enough for God to cast you into hell. Where there will be weeping and wailing, the gnashing of teeth, and absolute loneliness. So turn to Christ. Turn to Christ. To circumvent the burnt sacrifice, to circumvent Jesus Christ, and to jump directly without Jesus into an attempt to have fellowship with God is a terrifying thought. Jesus said that the only way to the Father is through him. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man can come to the Father but through me. That's it. No prophet, no other priests, no other gurus, only Jesus. That's it. If you want to be in peace with God, then find that peace through Christ. That's the only way. And the purpose of the peace offering was to point the Old Testament church to this reality. To this reality that you need a blood sacrifice in order to stand and sit in the presence of God. Pointing to Jesus Christ. Now we see in verses 2, 8, and 13 that regardless of the animal being offered, you see that the man or the woman offering must press or lean themselves upon the animal to impute their impurities and infirmities upon that animal for the sacrifice to be accepted by God. In verse 8, we see that. And he shall lay his hand upon the head of his offering. Or verse 2, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of the offering. Verse 13, and he shall lay his hand upon the head of it. You see, this is what the Word of God or theologians call imputation. They're imputing, putting into their account, into the animal's account, their impurities. It's when you transfer what you have into the account of another. This one word is one of the most important words in the Bible, imputation which is defined to lay your hands upon the head of the offering. And that is the most important action that any person can take. To lay your hands upon the head of the offering. What do I mean? <clears throat> Congregation, <clears throat> when you say that you believe in Jesus, truly believe in having faith in his sacrificial death to take away your sins, it is necessary that you lay all your sins upon him for the salvation of your soul. When a person confesses that they are a sinner and that they have nothing in themselves to cleanse them of their sin, but Jesus, they are laying their sins upon the head of Jesus. They are imputing their sins on Jesus. And Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin for us. And he takes the sins upon himself and he puts it into his account so that he now becomes the debtor. And he now carries the debt that was ours. A debt that God says you must repay. A debt that you cannot repay. 
Jesus takes that debt and says, I will pay it for you. And your sins are burned away. Your sins are taken away by the greatest high priest, Jesus Christ. And that's not all. Jesus then imputes his righteousness into your account. He gives you his righteousness because we become the righteousness of God. That is imputation. And that is the gospel. And the peace offering, again, speaks the gospel when he speaks of laying his hand upon the head of the offering. That is what all this blood sacrifice and burning fire represents. And one of the greatest blessings that come from the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, where he takes away our sin and gives us his righteousness, is peace with God. Fellowship and friendship with God through Christ alone. Is that not worthy of praise to our great God? The beauty and great mercy of such a fellowship is that it is extended to all who believe in Christ, regardless of your social class. Whether you're rich, whether you're middle class, or whether you're poor, it does not matter with God. He accepts all. This is why with the peace offering, there are three types of animals given. The rich were to offer the ox or the cow. The middle class a lamb, and the poor would to offer goats because there are more abundance and they were cheap. You see, God does not exclude anyone from fellowship whom his son's blood has purchased. Rich or poor, all are welcome to have peace with God through Jesus Christ alone. Now recall that in a burnt offering, <clears throat> the offering for the poor was a pigeon or turtle dove. But here it is a goat. Why? Why a goat? Why a goat? Because of the nature of the peace offering. Recall <clears throat> what this, what's going on here in the peace offering. It is a meal that you eat in the temple. A meal that you eat in the presence of the Lord. A meal that you take your time eating with God. In his presence. And what do we read throughout the chapter? In verses 3 through 5, you see two kidneys. The fat is on them, which is by the flanks. And the call above the liver, which many believe is the gallbladder, with the kidneys. He will take all that away. And then you go down in verse 9. The same thing, right? The fat thereof, the whole rump. It shall he take off hard by the backbone, the tail, the fat that covers the inwards, and all the fat is upon the inwards, the two kidneys, and the fat is upon them, which is by the flanks and the call above the liver with the kidneys, it he shall take away. Or verse 9 through 11, you see, or as I just read that, verse 14 through 16, you see the same thing with the goat, the two kidneys, the fat, the flanks, the call, the liver, all of that. Why? Why the fat? <clears throat> Why the fat of the animal? You see, the fat and these organs were the richest, choicest, savoriest parts of the animal. And God wants that as his offering. It's a nutritious part. These portions of the fat have all this nutrition locked in them, all this flavor trapped in them. And the Lord asks for the saviorous parts. And a pigeon or turtle dove cannot have enough of that kind of fat. And all this points to fellowship. I remember our trip when my family was moving to Las Vegas from Maryland. 
back in 2021. We stopped at Reverend Andrew Barnes' home in Missouri, where he treated us to homemade Kansas City barbecue. The meat was fatty, and the ends, the fat, were so packed with flavor that I had never experienced anything like it before. I mean, that fat was just dripping. Everything's just dripping. That flavor was oh, jam-packed. And, and Andrew was like, that is, that is the best part of the barbecue. It wasn't lying. It was very satisfying. Never had something like that before. Everyone, I believe, has heard of the Japanese state, Waigu. You've heard it because it's super expensive, right? It's the, it's the meat of the rich. But why is it so expensive? It's because the fat of the meat is marbleized inside the muscle tissues of the meat. The fat is not on the outside of the meat as most cuts. And so this adds a, a tender, flavorful, savory taste to the meat that is incomparable. Well, people say so. I've never had that experience. I can't really say, but I will trust people who have had it. And so the Lord asks for the most flavorful parts of the animal. Children, children, I think some of you have seen your dad barbecue, right? You've seen your dad barbecue. What happens when your dad puts that meat onto the barbecue and the fat drips onto the fire? What happens? Right? That fire rises up. The fire crackles loud. And usually, the flame rises up, licking all that fat up. Just licks it up. Congregation, I want you to imagine the scene at the temple. You have the offer. He's leading his lamb to the door of the tabernacle. There is a line. I'm not sure how many lines because there's a lot of people. A lot of priests doing this. Imagine hearing the bleeding of animals. Children, how many of you have ever been to a petting zoo, been around sheep and goats? You hear them, right? Bleeding, making their noises. You hear the low murmuring of the offers as they lean or press their hands upon the animal, praying and confessing their sins, or praying in thankfulness for the forgiveness of sins. And then you hear a sudden grunt as the animal's throat are slit. The priest collects the blood. You hear the scraping of the blade against the animal's skin as the animal is cut up, opened up to remove the fat, the rump, the fat about the livers, the kidneys, the caul. In the case of the lamb, the fat that covers these organs into the tail. Then the priest takes all of these parts, and the burnt offering is already on the altar, being burnt up. The grain offering has already been offered by the offer. And now the fat that represents fellowship with God is then thrown onto the fire. Imagine now as all that fat is thrown upon the altar. What do you think the fire does? There's a thunderous roar and loud crackling as a fire rises up into the sky to lick every bit of that fat up. The sound would have been booming like fireworks. And that smell, that sweet smell rising from that fire is that Fat is thrown on there. How delicious and mouth-watering that smell would have been. Of all this meat thrown on there, all this fat being thrown on there. Then the priest, taking the blood of the animal, sprinkling upon the altar, again reminding, reminding the one that is sacrificing, that is because of the promised seed that we are redeemed. Verse 16, and the priest shall burn them upon the altar. It is the food of the offering made by the fire for a sweet savor. All the fat is the Lord's. Brethren, all of this 
<clears throat> would have been very much impressed upon the person sacrificing. A reminder that we live Coram Deo in the presence of God. A reminder that God is near to each one of us who believe in Jesus Christ. A manifestation that we are in covenant union with God, that we are invited to eat at his table. As Psalm 23 states, he has prepared a table for his people. Where the person sacrificing then gets to eat the rest of that meat, of the peace offering, who was not eating alone, but sitting with other worshipers and in communion with them as well, eating in the presence of God. As the fire roared, as it lapped up more and more fat as the sacrifices were being offered. The crackling of the fire, a constant reminder that God is also a consuming fire. And that he is present. And also a reminder that if we don't partake with faith, all of this is just going through the motions and in vain. Congregation, many come to church and they'll role play the part of being a Christian. They come as it was, as it were, going as if, as if you're going to work. I'm going to clock in, get my time card stamped, and put another stamp there for my fire insurance, my security against going to hell. Yet there are many unconverted people that do this and think that by worshiping, it is enough to earn them favor with God. That is not how you find favor with God. It has to be by faith in Jesus. When you worship God in the assembly, as you are seated, gathered here today, if you worship God by faith, it will have its good work done and accomplished. But if it is not by faith, then there is nothing that you will get out of it. So ask yourself, <clears throat> I went to church, I worshipped like I did last week and the week before that and the week before that, and I didn't get anything out of worship. Don't blame the pastor. Don't blame anyone else in the congregation. Look to yourself. Is it because you didn't properly prepare to come to the, in, in the presence of God? Is it, do you find worship boring because it does not fill your head with new knowledge? And maybe you are a Gnostic. Maybe you have a dead faith. Examine yourself. Is it because you lack faith in Christ and just go through the motions thinking God will give you an A for effort? Participation trophy. Well, know this. He will not. He will not. If you want a true relationship with God, true fellowship, and be in shalem with him, intimate peace, then repent of your sins. Turn away from trusting that you are a good person. Confess your sins to him. Lay your hands upon the precious head of Jesus Christ as your Redeemer and Savior, who is without blemish, and he will take away your sin as fire consumes meat. Give yourself to him and lay at his feet your subjection to him then you will have this union, this fellowship, this peace with him. <clears throat> On your own, you can never hope to be a sweet-smelling aroma to him. Ultimately, that was accomplished by only one person, our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 2 states this, Walk in love as Christ also has loved us 
and has given himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. He is our peace offering. He was the choice fat, the nutritious part, so that we can have peace with God. His sacrifice was our propitiation, appeasing the wrath of God, so that all who believe in him escape his just wrath, which we all deserve. It is Jesus alone who is our peace, and through him alone we have peace with God. Jesus came to mediate the conflict between the Father and humanity by offering himself up to the Father to be our peace. He gave himself for us because he loved us while we yet were sinners in our rebellion. And he pardons all who believe in him. And the Lord doesn't leave it at pardon. See, that's the beauty of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the beauty of the truth of the word of God, that not only does he pardon us, he has intimate fellowship with us. This is, again, what the peace offering represents. And those who are in Christ become a sweet aroma to God. Recall what Paul says, you are a living sacrifice. You are a nation of priests. When we come to worship, you're offering yourself up to God as a sacrifice. And if you are in Christ, you are that sweet aroma that he smells in Jesus Christ. Again, this is what this is pointing to. Listen to the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> how he describes Jesus Christ in relation to the peace offering. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest a savor of his knowledge by us in every place. For we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. To the one we are the savor of death unto death, and to the other the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? How great is our God that even his knowledge is savory. And they who believe in him become a sweet savor of his mercy. As you are called to present yourselves to God in public worship as a living sacrifice, hear the promise of the gospel to you who believe that your worship this day, when done by faith, rises up into the heavenly places as a sweet-smelling aroma which Jesus Christ, our great high priest, gathers for his Father and presents it to him, which in turn pleases him. We then enjoy the great comfort of his sweet fellowship and peace because he is pleased with the blood of his son, which was shed for you. Again, the peace offering foreshadowed and signified this reality. And Jesus Christ has now fully accomplished and applied this act of redemption to all who believe in him. Praise the Lord. Let us stand as we close in prayer. Our Lord and our God, we come before you in Christ to give you thanks for so great a salvation that in Jesus Christ we have peace with you. Oh Lord God, what a great and marvelous truth this is. That we who believe in you not only have our sins and the guilt and penalty of our transgressions taken away, not only is your righteousness 
given to us. But you grant us peace with you. You adopt us as your sons and daughters so that we can have intimate fellowship with you. What a glorious truth this is. May everyone here who believes in you be built up in the faith, strengthened in their walk with you, that you are with them. You are their shalem, their peace. And may those who have yet to know this peace of God, may this be the day that your spirit draws them to, your, to, to yourself, to a saving knowledge in Christ, that they too may enjoy peace with God. This we do pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.